Uh, I'm none of those things, including the girlfriend, uh, except for white. Yeah. Uh, I'm 100% asexual, which means I'm not into any stuff, but I'm everything romantic, which means I'm into other stuff. Yeah, no, I'm confused too. Don't worry about it. <laughs> We're all in this together. so much that Pygmalion doesn't like women, he just doesn't like women who do things like talk and have sex. I don't know how to tell you this, buddy, but we do have a word for that now. Several words, actually. And then there's Athena, noted as one of only three beings who Aphrodite holds no power over, the other two being Artemis and Hestia. And while Artemis hanging out with her huntresses and forswearing forever the company of men can be interpreted a few different ways, Athena is pretty explicit. In the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, the singer goes out of their way to specify that Athena has no time for Aphrodite's shenanigans, and instead of dealing with any kind of romantic shenaniganery, prefers to spend her time on the art of war, as well as the art of art in general. This trait of hers is so iconic and universally recognized that it contributes to her most famous epithet, Athena Parthenos, the Virgin Athena, aka what the Parthenon is named after. Personally, I think her Promakos epithet is cooler. It means she who fights on the front lines. Except in the battlefield of love. Chrysostom is ordered that at his funeral they should read all the whiny poetry he wrote about Marcella and how she's super mean, but as they're working their way through his extensive collection, who should appear to crash the party but Marcella herself, who in defense of herself pretty much vivisects the entire concept of the friend zone. Her argument is basically that her beauty makes them feel entitled to her, but the fact that someone finds her attractive doesn't mean she owes it to them to find them attractive. They're acting like she's choosing to not be interested when she certainly can't and won't force herself to pretend to be attracted to someone she isn't just because they'll be upset she doesn't reciprocate their feelings. She didn't lead Chrysostom Stone on, he just refused to process his emotions like an adult and treat it like it was an act of malice for her to not be into him. So yeah, file this under pleasant surprises I wasn't expecting to find in a 400 year old novel. I guess Cervantes was ahead of his time. See, Artemis's thing is that she didn't like dudes. Like, at all. Now there's no evidence to suggest that she liked girls either. Sorry, internet. See, Artemis is actually pretty textbook from a modern day perspective. She's never expressed an interest in sex and has only romantically loved one person, the hunter Orion. You may know him as that chunky star guy over the northern hemisphere. So no sexual attraction and romantic attraction only blooming after a long and already intimate relationship. Hey, would you look at that? It's maybe not a good idea to show your not safe for work god fan art to one of the only three Olympians who explicitly want nothing to do with that business. While Hermes sneaks around the back to find Ares, Artemis like awkwardly props an elbow on the door and goes all, Hello, boys. Looking for me? The brothers start fighting. As the battle escalates, Artemis transforms herself into a deer and jumps between them. Not in a, boys, please, there's enough of me to go around kind of way. More of a circular firing squad situation. When he asks her to narrow it down, she tells him she wants to be able to look at Endymion's beautiful face forever. Which is actually an instance of aesthetic attraction as opposed to romantic or sexual. Though it's a common misconception that aesthetic attraction follows from or inherently leads to romantic or sexual attraction, they are actually completely disparate. A fact that becomes obvious when one notes that your friendly neighborhood asexual is completely capable of appreciating gorgeous people in the same way one might platonically admire a sunset. What's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love but a second hand? Now Hippolytus has devoted himself to Artemis, choosing a life of hunting and no girlfriend over no hunting and yes girlfriend. This offends Aphrodite on principle, who reacts with about as much restraint as we've come to expect from her, and she resolves to ruin his life for having the audacity to not be into girls. In this version, he also moves to Latium and becomes a Roman god Verbius, because syncretism, and I think one line in the Iliad makes it seem like he actually married someone? Which kinda feels like it subverts the whole premise of the story, really. All right, I'm gonna level with you. I, honest to God, do not really understand this trope. Now that's a me problem, I understand that, but just realize that my attitude towards this trope is seriously skewed in some key ways. For one thing, I personally have enormous trouble recognizing when two people are in a relationship and what exactly that means to them. One time I asked a friend of mine how her relationship with another friend of mine was going, at which point she told me that they'd been broken up for two weeks. These are two weeks that I spent hanging out with them regularly, so it's not like I had the excuse of not being there to notice. Another time, two of my other friends had broken up earlier that day, and even after I was informed of this fact, I didn't understand why this meant they weren't sitting with each other at lunch anymore. Point is, even on a good day, I have, like, no sense for these things. And for another thing, I straight up don't see the appeal a lot of the time. It's a rare relationship, fictional or otherwise, that makes me think, oh wow, that looks like fun. I just, I don't get it. 
it is what it is. Now understandably, this has seriously affected how I view romantic subplots. I have trouble recognizing the build-up to a relationship as anything compelling, I have trouble relating to some of the characters' actions when they're actually in relationships, and a lot of the time I just don't really like the part of the story that centers on the relationship. But part of the problem here is these are all parts of storytelling that actually have endemic writing problems that serve to make them less compelling across the board. So although I'm basically working with blinders on, I have attempted to codify what exactly those writing problems are, as well as ways that romantic subplots have been done so well that even I can appreciate them. I think the moral of this story is that Artemis had the right idea. In this game, the only way to win is not to play. But this all sounds pretty weird, right? Because a lot of you have probably heard that Orion was the only man Artemis ever loved. First of all, no. But more specifically, no. Anyway, as near as I can tell, Orion only ever gets written as Artemis' tragic dead boyfriend because a handful of translators, Baroque artists, and 19th century poets decided it was more dramatic that way. And that the only reason a dude and a lady would ever want to hang out and talk about their mutual interests together is if they also wanted to bone. This single interpretation conveniently ignores that it's vastly outweighed by the number of versions where Artemis kills Orion on purpose for trying to assault her friends, but hey, what are you gonna do? Either way, Orion ends up dead and Artemis goes back to force wearing forever the company of men and all that that entails. Well, I guess that tears it, given the choice between boyfriends and the moon. Moon, girls pick the moon every time. Well, I'm so above you, and it's fine to see, but I.